Joining me now to discuss the 2018 midterms is the keeper of the crystal ball, director of the University of Virginia, Center for Politics, Larry Sabato, and still with us in Washington, our CBSN political contributor, Molly Hooper, and McClatchy News White House correspondent, Franco Ordonez. Larry, I'd like to start with you. There are two Senate races still outstanding at this point. It appears the Florida Senate race is headed for an automatic recount. And in the Arizona Senate contest, Roughly a quarter of the ballots are still out. Again, I realize this may be a bit um, asking you to speculate. However, are there tea leaves to be read? And if so, what are those tea leaves telling you? Well, actually, I checked with a number of people uh, who are experts in both Florida politics and Arizona politics, and essentially over-summarizing what I was told, uh, I think Florida is very likely to go to Rick Scott in the end. Uh, there's always a chance that something could be discovered in the process, but he's likely to get it. Arizona, though, is very much up in the air. Um, no one's really sure the profile of those ballots and which way they will sort out in the end. And it's close enough right now between the Republican Martha McSally and the Democrat Kirsten Sinema so that those ballots could more than make the difference. So I think that one should stay up in the air. And of course, the one in Florida, you don't want to bring down the curtain until the end of the play. Well, in addition to Florida and Arizona, Mississippi's special Senate election is headed for a runoff after neither candidate won a majority. Larry, how big of a fight should we expect around this race before the next round in a few weeks? Well, the parties are free to spend whatever they want, and uh, both parties undoubtedly have some money left over, and some of the uh, independent PACs and other groups that, uh, dark money groups that fund candidates or do independent expenditures, they probably have some money left. I, I think, again, without uh, closing the door on the possibility of a victory by Mike Espy, uh, who, of course, was in Bill Clinton's cabinet, uh, every public and private poll tracking I've seen uh, has the Republican incumbent who was appointed to succeed Thad Cochran winning by a mile in this runoff. Uh, we remember Doug Jones in Alabama. You know, it's mm -hmm. possible to have an incredible upset, but I wouldn't bet on it. Well, Molly, it was a good night for Republicans overall in the Senate, especially mm -hmm. in states President Trump won in 2016. Are we seeing the two parties sort themselves out when it comes to rural and urban states? Well, well, that, well, exactly. That's that's the question. It, it's unclear. I mean, if you look at a state like North Dakota, where um, Heidi Heidkamp was was le you know she was this Democrat re representing this red state, um, she lost lost overwhelmingly to Kevin Kramer, who well, incidentally was um, the House member in that in that state and an at-large member at that. So he actually had one statewide office. Um, but I think that that's where Democrats are having some problems. If you look at this, the, the districts that Republicans um, lost, the, the districts that President Trump mentioned, Carlos Curbelo, that was a Hillary district. Mm -hmm. um, Mia Love was not a Hillary district, but uh, but she did have, she was up faced with the medicinal marijuana was on the ballot in Utah. That didn't work to her advantage. But a number of those Republicans who sat in districts that Hillary Clinton won, they either didn't run for re-election or they lost their races. Well, Larry, Democrats fared better in governor in the races for governor, especially in the Midwest, with one major exception, Ohio. Why do you think this race turned out so differently compared to Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin? You know, one of my uh, outstanding crystal ball uh, executives uh, published a book about Ohio politics. He's probably the number one expert about Ohio politics. It was called The Bellwether. Well, uh, we've come to a conclusion together that Ohio is no longer a bellwether. Uh, it voted for Trump by between eight and nine percentage points in 2016. It has becoming, it has been becoming more Republican at various levels, not just the presidential level. And I think this election was really revealing. Uh, it wasn't simply that they lost the governorship. It was also that Democrats lost the ability to defeat several Republican incumbent congressmen in a year when they really should have, based on what happened in other states in similar districts. Well, while Democrats made gains in state houses across the Midwest, um, 
uh, Republicans largely held on to governorships on the East Coast. Franco, why were Democrats unable to win in blue states like Maryland and Massachusetts? Look, I mean, I think, I think you pointed out pretty well about the divide between urban and rural voters. Uh, Trump obviously was getting out there into many of these rural areas um, and, you know, putting on a big charge. Um, I think there's, you also mentioned earlier about the Kavanaugh um, and enthusing some Republican voters um, and perhaps some Democrats who were kind of on the fence, who felt uh, that Kavanaugh uh, was uh, improperly accused of, of some of the things that he was accused of. Um, but, you know, it was interesting watching the press conference earlier today. I was there listening to President Trump talk about uh, this, and he kind of revel mm -hmm. um, in the Republicans who did not go his way, who would not align themselves with the president. Mm -hmm. um, and he seemed to be sending a very clear message to his allies, as well as adversaries, that if you don't align with me, then you're going to lose, uh, which seemed to set up. Uh, you know, future battle for the next two years. Yeah, that was really a remarkable moment. Uh, finally, I want to ask each of you, what result surprised you the most last night? Larry, I'll start with you. The, the result that surprised me the most, I really was surprised by Ohio, mm. uh, and I was also surprised by Florida. Those, those results for a governor in both states and also senator in Florida contradicted not just the public polling, but also the really expensive and well done trackings uh, that led to the views of most of the professionals in politics. So it just goes to prove we haven't worked out all the problems with polling. We've worked out some of the problems. Mm -hmm. It's better than it used to be, but it's still not perfect. Polls are an imprecise instrument. In our last minute here, uh, Molly, what about you? Well, I was surprised but that the stars, so to speak, like an Andrew Gillum and a Beto O'Rourke that seemed to have all this star power, mm -hmm. um, that they actually lost, but, but races again for these Republican incumbents like Carlos Curbelo, John Culberson, mm -hmm. um, Pete Sessions, and that's in Texas, they all lost their races. And, and, you know, talking to sources, it had a lot to do with those Democratic stars getting people to the polls. And even though they didn't win the, the key races, they t ended up taking out some key House members, um, sort of in their, their, their tailwind. And Franco, their, uh, sorry to cut you off, uh, Molly, we uh, have about 30 seconds here, Franco. Uh, I, just, I just echo what Bali is saying. I think the Beto O'Rourke, while he didn't win, uh, the enthusiasm that he provided um, and really raised some questions about Texas um, and its grip on, uh, on Republican red state, as well as Georgia um, and Stacey Abrams about how close uh, she came uh, to being the first black female governor um, in the United States. I didn't think she could win. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Georgia. I thought it was a very big of a long shot, and she came very, very close. All right, Larry Sabato, Molly Hooper, and Franco Ordonez, thanks to you all. Really appreciate it.